Thank you so very much, uh, Christopher. The uh, topic of the roundtable this afternoon is Dare to Serve, Political Leadership to Serve the Common Good. This morning I already had uh, an opportunity to say a few things about the, the common good, but this is a topic that can be dealt with at length, and I still think that it's uh, worthwhile taking a few more minutes to uh, um, speak a few more words about the, the common good, especially in the context of the topic of the roundtable this afternoon. So I didn't give you a definition uh, this morning. So. Uh, there is one very classic definition of the common good. I'm going to um, speak it out slowly. It's not very complicated, but uh, it's not very short. So it's the following. The common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. So let me come back. Some total of social conditions, social conditions, which allow people, and you have noticed, either as groups or individuals. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the relationship between the group and the individual, which I said this morning, is one of the key elements of the notion of, of the common good, which allow them to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. After all, that's what we want, all of us. We want to live in a society where we can unfold our talents. And we have the, the right to have that expectation. And if it's true for us, <laughs> it's true for the others also. Um, now, as, as you understand from the definition, the common good does not consist of in the uh, simple sum of the particular goods of each subject of social uh, of a social entity, of course. I mean, uh, the total is more than the sum of uh, the, the parts. Uh, if you want a shorter definition, um, I have another one which doesn't cover uh, as best as the previous one the, uh, the matter, but I, I, I suggest the following. Common good can be understood also as the social and community dimension of the moral good. Social and community di di dimension of the moral good. Now, what does a society do when it has the common good as its primary goal? but such a society, society wishes and intends to remain at the service of the human being, at the purpose, at the service of the human being. And here we have the overall topic of our roundtable this afternoon. So service of the human being at every level. Now I want to insist, because we're going to talk about political leadership, about the role of the state, so I want to restate, because it's essential, that the common good is not exclusively the responsibility of the state. I repeat what I said this morning. We, all of us, have our share of responsibility according to uh, our possibilities to contribute to the, the common good. And all the components of the society, corporation, groups, associations, etc., NGOs, have also their share of responsibility. But now, what is the specific task of the political community? So, definitely, besides falling to individual persons, the responsibility for attaining the common good belongs to the state. When I mean state, I mean it's state in the very broad sense of the world, of the world, public sector, I mean, uh, uh, public uh, community uh, at, at all uh, levels. So the uh, notion of state here has to be understood in its broader, broadest um, understanding. Belongs to the state since the common good is the reason that the political authority exists. So common good is really the raison d'etre, as I said this morning, also the source of the legitimacy of what public authority does. So a, a key a key element here. So now, the role of, uh, of the state more specifically. Uh, we all know that this role has to be, in a way, redefined. In the 19th and 20th century, we witnessed kind of a burgeoning development of, of the state, l'état providence, uh, where whenever a 
an activity, a task of public relevance was identified, everyone would say, that's for the state, it's for the state to do. Now, we know and understand where these letters were in a, were in a particular si particularly difficult situation with that view. But then we witnessed with the uh, neoliberal approach, uh, kind of a challenge to this notion of the state, but to the extent that some would even question the, the role and the existence in principle of the state or would want to limit its role consider considerably while recognizing that the private sector and the market can adequately address all the needs or almost all of them that the state was supposed to take care of. Now that's also a challenge. That's definitely also a, ch uh, a challenge as we see. I mean the a loss of a sense of um, le service public, public service. So, but where are the limits? Uh, and the challenge doesn't come only from a philosophical perspective. It also simply comes from the growing gap between expenses and available resources. There are simply limits to what uh, the, the state can do in terms of expenses, deficit, etc. So what, what criteria to use to identify the specific tasks of the um, political community? Again, remember what I said this morning, no ideology, no model, no fixed model. Now that's the time for us to think about the respective roles of the state in the broad sense that I used this morning and the private, uh, in the private sector. And here, no surprise, I will suggest that, of course, always bearing in mind the key criterion of uh, the human dignity, I will suggest that the notion of the common good is an essential um, criteria. It's not sufficient, but an essential one. Where there is no common good issue, there is no role for the state. Now, the criterion of subsidiarity, of course, plays a, an absolutely crucial role. And I think that we have to discover or rediscover what the uh, criteria of subsidiarity can tell us today as to what the specific tasks of uh, public um, communities are. At the territorial level, to start with, um, in, in our states, we have witnessed, a con in various states, I mean, not all of them, a continuous flow of responsibility from the local level to the regional level to the national level. Well, we have countries where movements in the other directions, uh, direction have taken place, but we know that even in these countries, the discussion is still very lively and, 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 uh, and actual. Subsidiarity useful essentially also when it comes to defining the respective responsibilities of the private sector and the, the public sector. And here we have discovered in recent years new models for uh, tasks of public interest or common good to be taken care of by jointly the private sector and the state. So I'm not suggesting that every uh, task could be um, uh, I mean, adequately addressed by way of a private-public partnerships, but definitely these new forms and others might be interesting in redefining the role of the, st uh, of the state. Another criteria that I mentioned this morning, and which is essential, is the one uh, of participation. Participation is essential in the public uh, community. First, I would suggest, surprise, surprise, for a lawyer, when it comes to the legitimization of rules. One tends to forget the role of law in a society and the necessary adequate relationship between power and law. If there is no state, who is going to give legitimacy to the most fundamental rules in a given society? So rule is not there, no, law is not there just simply to uh, give uh, jobs to lawyers uh, who are I mean, people with uh, technical expertise, uh, hopefully. And usually I, ex I experienced that in, uh, in, in my professional life. Just to give you uh, an example, and I've been authorized by the minister. I, I work with three different ministers by uh, one of them. I work with, I've been authorized to uh, mention this example. 
So the first day she was in office, she called me and said, oh, good morning, uh, what are you doing in this house? I was director of international law in the foreign ministry. What are you doing in this house? So I explained a little bit. We had a good, uh, good discussion. And at the end of the discussion, she told me, well, that's very simple, Mr. Michel. Well, she is somebody with a, little bit, well, a lot of humor, etc. But still, she told me, Mr. Michel, I understand. It's very simple. I will tell you what I have decided, and you will give me the legal reasoning. So if that's the role of law in a society, if, uh, we are in trouble. So the, uh, the state has definitely an essential role in legitimizing the fundamental rules, participation here. The participation also of the voters, elections or in countries where there are referenda, initiatives, etc. Also a broader participation of all the citizens. Participation also in the insti institutions, of course, through uh, parliaments and uh, through other ways of uh, bringing the, uh, uh, the citizens to participate in the decision-making uh, process. Participation also in new ways through the role of civil society. At the international level these days, civil society organizations play a huge role. And this is something I mean, to be uh, probably satisfied with, but to some extent. Because where is the democratic legitimacy of some of these groups that are playing a very important role in decision-making processes? So these groups are necessary, but the issue of their participation in political decision-making processes needs to be adequately uh, addressed. So participation. And then, of course, also solidarity. Because who is going to take care of the dimension of solidarity? If everyone in the society adequately exercises his or her responsibilities in terms of common good, solidarity will be taken care of in a large extent, but most likely not fully. So there's definitely also a role for, for the, the state and for states.